Jeffrey Deskovic, and we thank you so much. I apologize in advance for the makeshift desk. I know, I know Jeffrey will do a great job. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, very nice to be back. This is my third appearance at Adelphi. Um, this was one of my, actually this was my first at large, location of my first at large presentation, meaning something open to the public. I had done one before that, but that was closed, limited to a specific uh, class. So this was open to everybody. So this was, uh, have kind, of, kind of had like a sentimental meaning. So in terms of orientation, uh, so I'll, my lecture tonight will be uh, discuss my story. So that'll uh, have my arrest and conviction, time in prison, appeals and exoneration. Uh, I'll discuss uh, reintegration, systemic deficiencies that lead to wrongful convictions. I'll discuss some about my foundation. We'll open up for Q and A, and then have a short break after that, and then I'll get to do something fun. I'll get to speak about some topics I don't normally uh, get to speak about. Uh, so I'm going to discuss um, uh, false confessions and interrogations. We'll go into the, the criminal mind, which I know is something that's been studied. So I'm going to hit different facets of that. So I'm going to discuss uh, inmate education, alternatives to incarceration. We'll discuss crime deterrence. Uh, go into parole a little bit. The crossover of the sex offender training program with wrongful convictions. Uh, we'll discuss prison reform. We'll hit Brady violations, and if that all wasn't enough, we'll do a little bit about capital punishment. So if that's very sparse tonight in terms of substance of content, not. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, definitely you want to take photos and upload to social media. You must tag me. You must reference my name. Other than that, it's all uh, everything must go. So um, and I can see already. I have everybody's attention. That's always encouraging. Uh, really, the audience is really what gives the speaker the confidence, honestly, just to be holding the attention. I mean, people show up, so the more people, the better. But I can see here, it's a smaller group, but I've um, got everyone with a lot of attention, so I want to mix up to that. In 1989, a classmate of mine was found uh, murdered and raped. Big Skill is a small city with a population of approximately 25,000 people. Murders were very rare. So when this murder happened, it understandably created an atmosphere of fear, rumor, and paranoia. Parents were concerned with their own safety as well as the safety of their children. In high school, I was quiet. I was still myself. I didn't participate in very many organized sports. This made me seem strange to the kids in high school. In the course of the police investigation, the police interviewed many students from the school, and some of them told the police that they might want to talk to me because I seemed strange to them. This is what the police said initially attracted them to me. The other factor which they said attracted them to me was that they said that I was overly upset at the victim having been murdered. Sure, I was emotionally affected, but then again, so was the, uh, everyone else in the city. I'm kind of keeping in mind I hadn't been a murderer in 20 years, and it was to the point where free mental health services were offered to anyone in the city of Peekskill who uh, wanted to avail themselves. So for about six weeks, the police played this cat and mouse game with me, in which half the time they would talk to me as if I was a suspect, while the other half the time they would uh, pretend to need my help to solve the crime. They would say things like, the kids won't talk freely around us, but they will around you. Uh, let us know if you hear any rumors. Uh, they made me the center of attention. They made me feel important. They would ask me opinion questions and then congratulate me on my opinions being correct. I came from a single parent household in which my father was never involved in my life at all. And so one of the techniques that the police employed, the uh, good cop, bad cop, otherwise known as Mutt and Jeff. So that kind of intersected with that absence of a father figure because I began to look up to the officer who was pretending to be my friend. Uh, the other thing is that my fantasy career as, a, as an adult my thoughts pre-teenage years was that I actually wanted to be a cop. So this unexpected early opportunity to do this quasi-police work was another, along with my age, uh, being 16, was how the police were able to pull the wool over my eyes uh, in terms of the absurdity of a 16-year-old being able to assist them on a homicide investigation. There reached a point in the investigation that the police asked me to take a lie detector test. They 
told me that there was some new information that had just come in from the police and the police file, and they wanted to share that with me, and that this would put me in a better position to assist them. So help us to help you to help us type the logic was employed. So I agreed to take the test. Uh, the next day, rather than report to school, I instead went to the police station. As I just mentioned, it was a school day, which meant neither my mother nor my grandmother with whom I lived uh, realized that I was uh, they realized that anything was wrong. They, as far as they knew, I was in school, and therefore, they did not call around looking for me. I thought that the test was going to be in Peekskill because I had heard that other uh, students had been polygraphed there. But instead, uh, I was driven from the city of Peekskill, which is in Westchester County. I was driven to Brewster, which was in Putnam County, so about 40 minutes away. And the reason why that's important is that that meant I was not able to leave on my own anymore. I was instead dependent upon the police. There were two officers there, uh, well, two detectives and one lieutenant from Peekskill, but then there was the polygraphist. The polygraphist was dressed as a civilian and he was uh, pretending not to be a cop. And therefore, he never read me my Miranda warnings. I did not have an attorney present. I wasn't given anything the entire time that I was there. I was put in a uh, small room and given countless cups of coffee, which seems fairly clear in hindsight now. The purpose of the coffee was to get me nervous. The premise of the polygraph is that when a person tells a lie that they'll become nervous and the nervousness will result in an increased pulse rate, and it's the pulse rate which is actually measured by the machine. Other factors which would lead to an increased pulse rate would include fear and caffeine. So after giving me countless cups of coffee, uh, the polygraphist then attached me to the polygraph machine, and uh, shortly thereafter he launched into his third degree tactics. He invaded my personal space, he raised his voice at me, he kept asking me the same questions over and over again. As each hour passed, so too did my fear increase in proportion to the time. So what he kept that up for like six and a half to seven hours. Another factor which I want to point out is that I was not used to talking or interacting with uh, adult males. I was uh, 16 years old. So and he was really a mountain of a man. So it really, really was uh, very, very uh, frightening to me. So towards the end of the interrogation, he said to me, I guess he was exasperated because to that point he hadn't gotten me to confess. Uh, he said to me, what do you mean you didn't do it? You just told me through the test results that you did. We just want you to verbally confirm it. So when he said that to me, that really uh, ratcheted up my fear. And it was at that moment that the officer who was pretending to be my friend, he came in the room and told me that the uh, other officers were going to harm me, that he was holding them off but could not do so indefinitely, uh, that I had to help myself. And when he added that if I did as I wanted, that not only would they stop what they were doing, but that I could go home afterwards, that I was not going to be arrested. So being young, naive, frightened, 16 years old, not thinking about the long term, instead just being concerned with my safety in the moment. I, I was in fear of my life because I was really conscious of the fact that I didn't know where I was and nobody else knew where I was either totally overwhelmed emotionally and uh, psychologically and then there was the push-pull dynamic in play because on one hand they had introduced the possibility of harming me and then on the other they uh, threw me this false life preserver. So I clung to that and I clung to his lie that I was not going to be arrested because I needed something to hold on to and that was the only way I saw that I could get out of there. And so I made up a story based upon information which they had given me in the course of uh, the investigation, both that day and in the uh, six weeks run up to it. Um, by the end of the um, police interrogation, I was uh, curled up into a ball on the floor in a fetal position. I was um, crying uncontrollably. Uh, needless to say, I was arrested. I was charged with a murder and rape. Now, before I went to trial, the results of a DNA test came in from the FBI lab showing that semen found in the victim didn't match. But rather than acknowledge they made a mistake, they instead continued to prosecute full speed ahead. 
in order to counter the negative uh, DNA test, the prosecutor solicited fraud on the part of the medical examiner. When there's, when there's an autopsy done, the medical examiner is um, supposed to make audio and written recordings as the findings are made as a way of ensuring authenticity. So it was only six months after doing that autopsy and only in response to the DNA not matching me, that six months, that six months from when he did the autopsy, then finally the medical examiner says that he found medical evidence to show that the victim was a 15-year-old uh, immigrant from Colombia who had been in the country for about a year and a half. She lived a really sheltered life, so she never went outside really unless she was with her older sister or her parents. So the, he, the medical examiner claimed that he found medical evidence showing that she had been sexually active. In so many words, they were trying to say that she was sleeping around with virtually everybody. Uh, so in order to wrongfully convict me, they were willing to trash her reputation. T taking it uh, a step further, the prosecutor named another youth by name that he claimed had had the sexual encounter with the victim. But he never had a DNA test performed in order to prove that. He didn't even call this other youth as a witness to give verbal testimony to that effect. He simply made the unsupported argument to the jury. At the same time, the public defender that I had was terrible. He really, he essentially didn't defend me. Uh, he never interviewed nor called as a witness my alibi. I was actually playing wiffle ball at the time that the crime happened. When it was time to cross-examine the medical examiner and discredit his theory, which was the right route to go in order to try to make the DNA evidence stand up. Uh, when it was time for cross-examination, my lawyer stood up in open court and with a big uh, smile on his face, as if him and the medical examiner were great friends with a really long history, said to him, you're going to be pleased to know that I don't have a single question for you. When the Prosecutor made the unsupported argument to the jury as to this other youth that he was falsely claiming and had sex with the victim. Uh, my lawyer was supposed to jump on that and the defense was supposed to subpoena this other youth and ask for a DNA test. But we could not because of a conflict of interest. So my lawyer should have never represented me in the first place because this other youth that the prosecutor was making this false claim about was represented not only by another member of Legal Aid Society, but also specifically by the lawyer who was supposed to be supervising him on my case. When, when we were deciding whether or not to have a bench trial, which was decided by a judge or a jury trial, my lawyer came to me one day and told me that the judge had come to him off the record and told him to pick a jury because he didn't want to be responsible for finding me not guilty. My lawyer was supposed to put that on the record and ask the judge to recuse himself because a statement like that shows bias and suggests that perhaps the uh, judge is feeling some public pressure. But he didn't. He very rarely met with me. Whenever he would meet with me and I would try to explain to him that I was innocent and what happened in the interrogation room, uh, he was always shutting me up. He told me one point that he didn't care if I was guilty or innocent. I never had any experience with the justice system, so when he said to me, just look, just sit back, relax, I got this, I'm the lawyer, you're not, you're 17, let me do my job, I listened to him, because I didn't know any better. I wanted to testify at the pre-trial hearing. Whenever there's uh, statements that are made, there's a pre-trial hearing that the court has to hold, called in New York a hunting hearing in which the judge has to determine whether or not the suspect has been given their rights and whether they made a knowing, intelligent, and voluntary waiver of them deciding to speak to the police. And that hearing has to be held before the statements could be used as evidence at the trial. So because my interrogation was not video nor audio tape, uh, nor was there a signed confession, it was just simply the officer's word as to what happened, they were able to get away with conveniently leaving out the threat and the false promise, uh, both of which were illegal tactics which they uh, engaged in. So I wanted to testify at that pre-trial hearing to put those facts on, on the record. 
but my lawyer wouldn't allow me to testify at the pre-trial hearing. He told me that he hadn't decided if I was going to testify at the trial or not, and if he didn't, he didn't want to have me under oath as to what happened in, in the interrogation prior to my testifying at trial, saying that the prosecutor could use the prior testimony and question, question me and try to make it appear as though I was lying, even if I wasn't. But that line of reasoning really didn't make much sense because, first of all, if the judge had believed me, then the statements would have been ruled involuntary and therefore inadmissible and lacking any other evidence, there would not have been a trial. And secondly, if it really went that badly, uh, I didn't have to take the trial, the stand at the trial, and if I didn't, then the prior statements couldn't be used that way either. But then when we got to the trial, uh, he wouldn't allow me to testify there either telling me that his personal one-loss record was significantly better when his clients didn't testify as compared to when they did. Probably that's true. But then again, most of his clients probably have a pre-existing criminal record, and if you take the stand with the record, then the prosecutor would be allowed to ask questions about the prior crime. But that didn't apply to me because I didn't have a prior record for anything. And his second rationale as to why uh, he was not calling me as a witness since he claimed that it wasn't his job to prove that I was innocent. It was up to the prosecutor to prove that I was guilty and he didn't think that it happened. Well, I guess from a legal technical point of view, yeah, that's a legal maxim. Sure, that's true. But that's not actually how it works in real life. I mean, in real life, if you are charged with a crime, you have to do everything in your power to try to prove your innocence or you run a risk of possibly being wrongfully convicted. Uh, particularly in a case where there's a confession. is an 80% conviction rate in cases that have a uh, confession. So if you're defending a confession case, you have to answer that confession. How better to do that than to maybe call an expert and or your client. So but he uh, didn't allow me to testify. He, he called no expert. Um, and wrapped all up, I guess it's not too surprising that the jury found me guilty. I'll never forget the day that I was found guilty. It felt like I was in some sort of nightmarish alternative reality. Because to my way of thinking, at least up to that point in time, only guilty people were convicted. Yet, the jury said what they did, and I was taken into custody. On uh, the day of the sentencing, I begged the judge to overturn the verdict because I was innocent, and I referenced the DNA to support my contention. He actually told me on the record, maybe you are innocent, conceding that there was a doubt. I mean, how could there not be a doubt? I mean, the DNA didn't match me. Yet, instead of stepping up for justice and overturning the conviction, which he could have done by reversing any number of rulings that he had made against me in the course of the trial, he instead uh, took the easy, politically expedient way out, which was to sentence me to a term of imprisonment of uh, 15 to life. I'd like to share with you some photos. So, this is my mugshot because I was not the adult that you see now when all this happened. I was actually significantly younger uh, than, than all of you. This is what I look like in the courtroom. So it's been announced that the jury has reached a verdict, but it hasn't been read yet, and I'm praying that things go uh, in the right direction, which they did. Here's what I look like at the sentencing. And... Um, <clears throat> Here is what I look like uh, shortly after entering Elmira Correctional Facility, which is a men's maximum security prison. I'd like to share with you a little bit about my prison experience. I still remember the first day. I remember being in handcuffs and having a chain around my waist and having my legs fastened together, as well as being fastened um, to the legs of the prisoner uh, next to me. I remember how menacing the barbed wire looked and how large those prison walls looked. I don't mind sharing with you that at 17 years of age, weighing 150 pounds, I take another look, wish. Uh, I was really, really frightened. I mean, what am I going to do if one of the prisoners there, grown men, many of whom were guilty of having committed very serious um, violent crimes, if one of them decided to attack me? Didn't take a lot of figuring out on my part that if um, any of them did attack me, you know, there's no way I'm going to fight them off. And then I had to be concerned that 
any of them discovered that, that I was incarcerated for rape along with the murder, that that would serve as motivation on their part to assault me because in prison there's a uh, vigilante mentality towards people who have been convicted of sex offenses. Uh, the guards themselves were obstacles. To be sure, some were professional and did their job, yet others brought their problems from their home life into the facility, displacing their aggression onto the prisoners. Then there were other guards who even their peers hated because the manner in which they conducted themselves on a day-to-day -day basis increased the odds that there could be prisoner to staff violence or that a riot could ensue and it could all like, suck all of them into it. But that didn't lead any of them to uh, put him in check or uh, you know, not, not his peers nor the people who supposedly were there to supervise them. Then there were other guards who just wanted to do their eight hours and go home and they didn't really care what happened while they were there. It might sound like an ideal attitude that you'd want a guard to have if you had to be incarcerated, but it didn't actually work out that way in real life because it would not be unusual for them to literally look the other way and walk in the opposite direction uh, when violence was occurring so as to be able to avoid having to break things up and file paperwork afterwards. There was a system of maintaining order in the prison known as keep lock, which involved a variety of sanctions being imposed on the prisoners that they were found guilty of having broken their prison rule. Those sanctions included being kept in a cell 23 hours a day out of the 24. They would send you less food, and sometimes the food would be three or four days old. You could take two showers one week and three the next, rather than being able to shower daily as the rest of the population. Uh, their idea of complying with the court mandated one hour a day recreation consisted of putting the prisoners in a small caged area with maybe a pillow bar in it, if you were lucky. You would not be able to use the, use the phone or purchase any food or hygienic items while you were on that status. In the facility in which I spent 13 and a half of the 16 years, uh, Elmira, it was uh, particularly violent there. There were three or four stabbings or cuttings every day. There was no shortage of violence that did not involve weapons, and there was plenty of gang members and gang activity. Taken cumulatively, there was a general atmosphere of violence and, and adrenaline that permeated the air. There were several times in the course of my incarceration that I was assaulted and one time in which I nearly lost my life. In addition to dealing with that physicality, I was also subjected to those sanctions that I mentioned because in prison, if you are attempting to defend yourself, then that means that you are fighting. In my mid-twenties, there were Several times I couldn't bring myself to just simply stand there and watch as people I had eaten, drank, and played sports with were assaulted in front of me, and so I helped to um, defend victims, you might say. But then I was uh, subjected to those uh, sanctions. When I was originally wrongfully in prison, my mother used to make the um, three and a half to four and a half hour trip from Peekskill to Elmira. But as the long trip grew on her, and things tightened up a little bit financially, and she developed a few health problems in terms of the back and the feet. I began to see her less and less until I was lucky if I saw her uh, once every uh, six months. Uh, my grandmother um, passed away while I was wrongfully uh, in prison. I remember um, the guards told me if I wanted to wait until she uh, until she actually passed and then go to the funeral or did I want to uh, see her while she was in a coma, unconscious. I didn't really understand why I had to pick. I mean, it would have killed them to let me go to both. I've always gotten motion sickness, and so one of the ways you protect yourself from getting sick when you have motion sickness is to eat before you begin the journey. We left Elmira for Peekskill early in the morning prior to the population being served breakfast. The guards were given funds with which to purchase food items, both for themselves and for me. But while they had a full complement of breakfast, I was simply given a cup of coffee. And as a result of that, I got extremely nauseous and they had to stop the car several times because I was on the verge of vomiting. But because I had very little in my stomach, fortunately nothing came out. Because if anything, if I had vomited and gotten anything on me, I wouldn't have been able to wipe it off. I, mean, I had on handcuffs and a chain around my waist and I, I could not, I couldn't move my hands and they wouldn't loosen it even though they were two officers, I was in manacles and they both had sidearms and surely I could not have posed a threat to them in that situation. We got to the hospital, they parked the vehicle as far away from the hospital doors as they possibly could so as to be able to parade me through the parking lot, again keeping in mind I had on handcuffs and a chain around my waist. 
I remember there was a nursing attendant on duty that did a double take at the sight of me and it was a child maybe five or six years old who was running around and playing and the mother brought her close to her and she saw me and as if I was some sort of violent animal that was going to commit a spontaneous act of violence right there on the spot. Definitely a humiliating situation. When it was time to go, the guards uh, came in the room and told me that my hour was up. I saw on the clock that actually uh, it had only been 45 minutes, but they insisted it was an hour and they forced me to leave again, parading me through the uh, hospital corridors and the uh, parking lot. This time I was given something to eat before the car started up again. Uh, however, uh, the car had been sitting there for you know, 45 minutes to, to an hour, and the spot where it had been sitting, it lent itself to the sunlight just beaming through the windshield, and so the car had become extremely hot. <clears throat> the guards turned on the uh, air conditioning, but because there was plexiglass fully separating the back of the vehicle from the front, uh, none of it reached me, and they were not willing to lower the windows even a fraction of an inch. All told, I, I suffered for close to, you know, between seven and eight hours in order to visit my grandmother for less than one hour. My brother is three and a half years younger than I am, and he also was impacted by my wrongful conviction. The kids in the school bus and in the school used to try to stab him with pencils and try to hit him and tell him that his brother was a rapist and they would say other nasty things and I guess being unable to get to me he was the next best thing. Towards the end of my sentence minimum the prison authorities told me that if I wanted to have any chance at all of making parole, which is already a slimmer than slim possibility as it was, I would have to take and complete the sex offender training program. The problem with completing that program however was that there was a guilt admission, require, uh, guilt admission um, requirement to it. Everybody in the shop would be expected to admit guilt, not just to the instructor, but to the um, other prisoners. And simply saying that one was guilty wouldn't cut it. They wanted details. A verbal rendition wasn't enough. It would all have to be in writing. And failure to complete any aspect of that would result in automatic removal from the program with the uh, prisoner being deemed to have refused to complete the program. When I went to the parole board, I knew that they were in the habit of rubber stamp denying applications from anyone who had been convicted of a, of a violent crime. Um, it didn't really matter what their record was. So knowing that, I tried to protect myself by repeatedly raising the issue of my innocence and referencing the DNA, but uh, even um, showing them my paperwork but they were not willing to entertain even the possibility that I was innocent, not even as a contextual issue to then evaluate uh, the rest of my application and determine whether it was likely if I was released that I would you know, remain free without uh, being arrested again. So they were not willing to go down that road at all. Towards the end of the interview, one of the commissioners asked me a question about an aggression replacement training program that I had taken and completed, and I was able to give the answer demonstrating I had learned the curriculum. That's when a different commissioner piped up and said, well, that's good, Mr. Deskovic, because you're going to need those skills once you return back to society. Good luck. The procedure is that they don't inform you the decision right there on the spot, but it's instead mailed via institutional uh, mail three days later. Considering how the interview ended, I actually walked around the prison for the next three days thinking that I had somehow defied the odds and would be going home. When I got the decision in the mail, it noted that I had a good educational record, that I had a good disciplinary record, that I had some letters of support, that I even had a letter from a prison employee recommending that I be paroled, but that nonetheless I had been convicted of a brutal and senseless crime and uh, to release me, they wrote, would be to uh, deprecate its seriousness. They ordered me to appear in front of them two years later. Now, I, at that point, considering that I knew many prisoners who were working on years 25 and 30 off of a 15 to life sentence in which they go to the parole board, uh, be turned down, reappear in two years, and be turned down again, and have that cycle continue in a seemingly never-ending uh, perpetuity, I felt pretty confident at that point that I was going to die in prison for a crime that I did not commit. While all that was happening, I was simultaneously appealing my case throughout the court system. 
I went to the appellate division, the first court of Muscogee, where my primary issues on appeal are my innocence and my uh, Fifth Amendment rights. The appellate division uh, wrote that I was not in custody, that I was free to, that I was free to come and go as, as I pleased. And they didn't um, see anything wrong with the way I've been questioned. Now, granted, they didn't have the threat and the false promise on the record, but they had plenty of all the other red flags. There was plenty to suggest that this was not a voluntary interrogation. And I don't see how, under those circumstances, and somebody is 16 years old, how, how there could be a knowing, willing, and intelligent waiver of one's rights. But they found that, that there, that there was. And in rejecting my um, innocence claims, they wrote that there was uh, overwhelming evidence of guilt, which I don't quite understand that ruling to this day. I mean, in light of the fact that the DNA didn't match me, they ruled against me uh, five to nothing. My lawyer moved to re-argue the my, uh, my case in front of them, arguing that their decision was quite contrary to the facts and the law, but the re-argument motion was denied. The New York Court of Appeals, where the procedure is that you have to get permission to appeal to them before they'll agree to uh, give you a substance of ruling, uh, the Court of Appeals uh, wrote that there was no merit in law to justify reviewing my case, and so therefore they were declining to review it. I lost in federal court because the court clerk gave my lawyer the wrong information regarding the filing procedure as a result of which my petition, which included, again, my Fifth Amendment argument and my innocence argument wrapped around the DNA, uh, the fact that I was um, late was deemed to be more important than the fact that I was arguing my innocence supported by the DNA, which meant that I was then time barred, which meant I was no longer able to argue my issues directly, but instead was relegated to arguing that this procedure of ruling against me was inaccurate in order to try to have that reversed, in order to then go back down to the lower federal court to then argue my issues directly. So I appealed that ruling to the Federal Court of Appeals, where much like the State Court of Appeals, you have to get permission from them before they've agreed to allow, allow you to actually appeal to them. So I was given permission to appeal on the, on the technical issue, and my lawyer advanced uh, three arguments as to why the procedure ruling against me should be reversed. Uh, the two judges on that panel were Judge Rosemary Pooler and future United States Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor. My lawyer argued that this was not a delay caused by me or my attorney, but instead by the misinformation by the court clerk. It seems like a reasonable enough argument to me, I mean, legalese aside. Uh, my lawyer argued that to allow a ruling like that to remain in place would cause a miscarriage of justice to continue, which kind of indirectly harkens back to the innocence argument in the DNA. And lastly, my lawyer argued that Overturning the procedural ruling would open the door to more sophisticated DNA testing of the type which would go on to clear me seven years later. Once again, the district attorney opposed, and once again, the court ruled with the district attorney. My lawyer moved to re-argue the case in front of them, requesting that all the judges on the circuit hear the case and make a ruling, but the re-argument motion was denied. That meant we had one court left to go to, the United States Supreme Court, which nationally agrees to hear only between 2 to 5 percent of the total number of cases that come in front of it. Included within that paltry figure is a certain amount of civil litigation. So the odds of them agreeing to hear my case, despite compelling reasons of justice, were slim. Having no other court left to go to, I had no choice but to forge ahead. I was not able to overcome the odds. As expected, the United States Supreme Court declined to give me permission to appeal to them. That marked the end of my appeals and the end of legal representation. That was in 2001. Now at that point, because my appeals were exhausted, that meant I was no longer given a lawyer. So because I had no money with which to hire one, uh, or an investigator, and neither did my family or anyone connected to me. Uh, that meant I had to try to go and find one who would represent me for free. So my legal work at that stage, if we're going to be artsy about the word, really consisted of writing 
SOS type letters to anyone and everyone I could possibly think of who could be of any help to me, either directly or indirectly. I wrote large law firms because I had read that such firms often have a pro bono section in it in which they take cases for free. I very rarely heard back from them. When I would hear back, they would tell me that they had no time to take my case for free, although they always made sure before they closed their letter that I knew how much money they wanted uh, in the event that I managed to scrape it together. Reading between the lines, what they were really saying was that if uh, I had the money, then they would have the time. I wrote reporters, especially those who had written on other wrongful conviction articles or topics, reasoning that their general familiarity with the subject matter would put them in better position to understand what I was saying. Maybe they would dig around a little bit, write an article or two, and that way my case could come to the attention of the necessary legal help, as I had heard it happen in a few other cases that ultimately ended in exoneration. Only I never heard back from any of them. I wrote churches and other faith-based organizations, reasoning that their belief in God, in whatever form or faith that might take, would cause them to be in favor of justice and against injustice, and therefore favorably disposed to me. Perhaps there was a parishioner that they could prevail upon that could take my case, who was a lawyer or an investigator. Or maybe in the alternative, maybe they'd be willing to raise the money for me so that I could hire the necessary legal help. Only I never heard back from any of them. I wrote a lot of organizations, nonprofits, that do work to free wrongfully convicted prisoners. But the problem I ran into there, however, was that the amount of cases uh, clamoring for attention compared to the resources available, it was a really uh, big disparity. And so in the eyes of the case evaluators, I was unable to beat out the, the other cases in that uh, cruel competition. Eventually, I wound up in touch with, uh, with an investigator who worked out of Maine and out of Colorado. And when I mentioned that you know, DNA didn't match me, uh, she was initially skeptical. And when I sent the legal paperwork to her, that's when she perked up and she became a champion for my case. So she tried to get people to take my case. We brainstormed together and she gave me ideas. One of her ideas proved to be the winning one. She uh, suggested I get into contact with the Innocence Project, which uh, is a nonprofit organization in Manhattan that works to exonerate wrongfully convicted prisoners across the country in those instances in which DNA testing could demonstrate innocence and in which no prior testing had been conducted. I originally wrote them back in 1992, but DNA was still relatively new then. The data bank hadn't been created. and my case didn't fit the paradigm of cases that they took, recalling that they only wanted cases where there had been no prior testing. There was prior testing in my case. It didn't match me, but I was nevertheless convicted, and they never saw a case in which that had happened. So getting further testing and then arguing it was new was not going to work because it wasn't new. So. Fast forwarding back now 15 years to the investigator, she told me that with the advent of the DNA data bank that the prior <clears throat> denial was irrelevant, I should just write again. So I would not have thought to write them again, reasoning that I would get a similar uh, response and the questionnaire would be rather lengthy and time consuming. But I was running out of ideas and so I tried it again anyway. Uh, and then I forgot about it. I continued to look for other ways of obtaining representation, none of which were successful. So I didn't know it then, but I've learned since then that during that six months when I was waiting, there was again a debate within the Innocence Project because the lawyers again did not want to go forward with the case because of the pre-existing DNA exclusion. But every time that the case was turned down, one of the intake workers, who was not an attorney, would go back to the drawing board and would come up with another way in which DNA could be used to try to exonerate me in a fashion that it would constitute something new. So on the third try, using an idea that I had suggested myself in, in uh, of my letter um, to the Innocence Project, uh, she was able to convince the attorneys to take my case. So obtaining legal representation was the first most significant factor out of three. The second was that the prior district attorney who had 
prevented me from getting further DNA testing who uh, fought all my appeals, who got the court to rule that my being four days late was more important than my innocence. And, uh, Janine Pirro, who has her judge shows on television, she left office. So that was the second most um, favorable thing. And the third was that we got lucky in that the actual perpetrator um, committed an unrelated crime three and a half years later and gotten caught, which resulted in his DNA being put in a data bank so that when I was given the testing without having to litigate over it, uh, it matched him. Um, and he subsequently confessed both to the uh, authorities as well as to a reporter on video camera. September 20th, 2006, my conviction was overturned and I was released. I reported back to court November 4th, 2006, at which point all the charges against me were dismissed on actual innocence grounds. I got recognition of my innocence from the judge and the prosecutor, but neither of them were their counterparts who had been involved originally and wrongfully convicted me. At that point, I was free to go to try to somehow rebuild my life. Uh, with very little property beyond the suit that I had on. So I'd like to share with you a photo of uh, you being released. So this for effect for the call or before and or after. So this is what we're talking about in terms of human terms. It's very hard to put your life back together again after being through a traumatic experience such as that, uh, particularly one that lasted 16 years. Uh, in terms of typical uh, after effects, just on a psychological level for a second, uh, it's common uh, for exonerees to have post-traumatic stress disorder uh, related uh, afflictions such as anxiety attacks, panic attacks, is a feeling that one is moving at a slower speed than the rest of society, is a feeling of having been frozen in time. So for a long time I felt when I was released that I was you know, 32 physically, but I felt 17 internally because that was the last uh, year where I was uh, free. It was the social stigma attached to it. Uh, small amount of people, you know, might uh, question, you know, whether I was innocent or whether I was just out on a technicality. But those were in the minority because the actual perpetrator was caught, arrested, and convicted. So the stigma was more on the level of while you were there for 16 years wrongfully, yes, but you were there for 16 years. So how much of that rubbed off on you? Is it safe to be alone someplace with you? In terms of, uh, in terms of technology, the world was much different than what it was when I was originally in prison. To give some concrete examples, we didn't have uh, cell phones, GPS, uh, the internet wasn't uh, around. We didn't have all these ways of banking. As I walked down streets that I, uh, in various cities and towns that I once knew, while I recognized some of the buildings, houses, and structures, yet others were missing and were replaced with unfamiliar buildings, houses, and structures. I mean, people that I once knew that inhabited those areas had long since moved away. So in a lot of ways, I felt like I was in some sort of uh, alternative universe. One, one in which, um, a world really in which I uh, didn't uh, belong. It was a very awkward experience in terms of running into uh, members of my immediate and extended family. So when you go long periods of time uh, while having little to no contact, then the natural changes and growth in people and, and, and development are much more uh, pronounced. And so it was a very uh, awkward experience because I knew who different members of my extended family were because I had memories of them from when I was younger, but they were different people now, and they looked different, and I was somebody different also, so it was very difficult to uh, communicate uh, with them. I did a lot of, uh, I, I did a lot of work with uh, mental health professionals. I used to go for four or five hours a week for an uncountable number of years in order to get to the point where Know where I am now. I found a mission and purpose. So I, when I was uh, released, it was at this press conference right here. I, 
everything I ever wanted to say, but could never get anybody to hear. And it all just came out, and as I thought I was wrapping up, another topic came to mind, and another topic came to mind, and eventually it was uh, two, two and a half hours. And it was at that moment that I realized I could be uh, part of the innocence movement without necessarily being uh, an attorney. And so I embarked on an advocacy career which involved trading privacy for awareness, and writing articles as a columnist, and uh, doing, pres doing uh, presentations, meeting with uh, elected officials and testifying in um, legislative uh, hearings. And so for me, I, I make the way I make sense of everything in a kaleidoscopic uh, type of way is I look at it like uh, this is what I'm here for in the world, this is my mission, this is why I went through that. Um, that's how I make sense of it. I hold on to my sanity that way, so I, I can't abandon that uh, view. And I feel like I'm, I'm making a, a, a difference. So when I was eventually compensated, um, I uh, opened my nonprofit organization, um, the Jeffrey Deskin Foundation for Justice. So we um, exonerated two people, but we, overall we've gotten six people uh, out. Um, the other three people we got out on parole. So in, in order to exonerate somebody, it's not enough. You can't relitigate facts that were already known. That might be the reason why you're convinced of someone's innocence, but you can't go to court and re-argue what's already been litigated. You have to come up with something new, and it's not always possible to come up with something new. And so, uh, knowing that the uh, parole board usually turns people down for parole when they uh, assert innocence rather than accepting uh, responsibility and expressing remorse, so we uh, put together a letter summarizing why we believe in their innocence and uh, urging that they uh, be paroled. So we are three for six on that. So three times that our letters were persuasive. We got three people out, and the other three times you weren't listened to. Um, we do this for exonerations, not not paroles. But if it's not possible, I mean, getting out however however one can legally, you know, is, is much better than remaining in prison. And, and we got another um, person out actually a week ago. I've uh, been in for like 22 years. Um, we, Renzo Johnson, whose case just uh, was in the media, so he was in for 16 and a half years, he was released, and the Pennsylvania Attorney General appealed the reversal to the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, where they granted the permission to appeal and reinstated the conviction all in one shot, which resulted in my having to drive him back to prison, uh, where, uh, where I like without the wall sentence. Where he stayed for another five years until we, you know, losing a bunch more appeals, and finally investigative work, which was done. This was a collaborative effort with the Pennsylvania Innocence Project, uh, his attorney Michael Wiseman, the, and then it was the uh, Federal Capital Defenders of Pennsylvania. So he was a New York resident that had the unusual wrongful conviction twist of being wrongfully convicted in a state other than his own. And, and my foundation played a role in the investigation, but mainly on the public relational. Um, level. It's, it's very important in terms of keeping the uh, case alive and setting the context of what goes on in the courtroom. So anyway, just to come quickly with in terms of that particular case, um, we finally got it to the point where we were going to win. Right? And they had withheld uh, evidence that the only witness against him was actually an alternative suspect. That had never been turned over. The motive witness was had a quasi-familial relationship with the detective's mother, which had never been disclosed, and hundreds of pages have been withheld. So um, on the eve of the hearing, it took two years just to get to an evidentiary hearing. So on the eve, on the eve of the hearing, the Attorney General, realizing that uh, they were going to lose, decided to play really, really dirty and say, well, look, you know, uh, it may take anywhere from a week to six months for the judge to make a decision. We're going to appeal the decision a couple of times at least if we lose, and, and if we lose all that, then we're going to go back to trial. So, you know, if you want to stay in here for another two to five years, then, you know, go ahead and keep going with this. Or you can um, enter what's called a nolo contender plea. So basically, that's a type of guilty plea in which you tell the court you're innocent, but you're pleading guilty uh, in order because you're concerned that you may lose the case. So it's a damage control type of thing. So. Definitely a bittersweet moment. It wasn't what I wanted him to do, but it was his decision, and he, he 
was, he felt like, look, it's been 22 years already. How long are we going to keep going with this? You know, he was concerned about uh, his mother, who was like 81 years old. So that, that's the four people other than um, the ones I talked about on parole and our outright exonerations. Uh, been involved in policy work, uh, which was referenced at the beginning. Currently, the biggest uh, policy change I'm working on pertains to a commission on prosecutor conduct, which would be an uh, independent oversight board. There, there's independent oversight for the judges. There's the Commission on Judicial Conduct. Uh, every profession has oversight, even down to the barber. And yet there is nothing for the prosecutor. So we've been pushing a bill, myself and a uh, coalition group called It Can Happen to You, which um, made up of different exonerees, people falsely accused, various advocacy organizations and private citizens. Uh, and we come together specifically to push that particular reform. We've been very, very close to passing uh, that the last uh, last three years. And always at the last second, the prosecutors start calling their elected officials, and now we can't, even though we've got a lot of sponsors on both sides, they never want to bring the bill up to get a vote. We always get all the way into the end, and we get left at the altar. And really, that's something everybody can do. Uh, you know, in terms of making phone calls to the assembly people and uh, senators, and certainly uh, Long Island has seen plenty of prosecutorial misconduct uh, uh, from the lab in Nassau to the uh, uh, Suffolk County. Uh, what's going on there? I mean, there was even a resolution passed that district attorney is corrupt, and it's still nobody can get them out. But the commission on prosecutor conduct, if that was passed, that would be a way that something could be done. So let me uh, show you a few more uh, photographs. So there's another, uh, another picture here of when I was uh, released. Another. One of the more difficult moments of uh, reintegrating, getting the master's degree, starting the, uh, starting the uh, foundation. My buddy, William Lopez, our first exoneree, <clears throat> who passed after a year and a half of uh, freedom, after 23 and a half years. But I take umbrage in that, you know, he died a free man. He died with his innocence established, so I kind of say that to myself. Uh, to my left, a gentleman dressed even better than me, uh, William Hoggy. That's our uh, second, uh, second exoneree. We did eight years and four months on an arson case that actually was uh, an electrical fire. So the man who tried to put out the fire got charged with starting it. So, uh, as part of my advocacy work, um, I'm certified as an instructor in um, New Jersey in police academies. So I, uh, they bring me in for the uh, new cadets. Um, for the ethics portion of the training and going over best practices designed to prevent wrongful conviction and false accusations. Uh, in a lot of ways, I look at the police as the first line of defense to, to a wrongful conviction in the sense that if they don't arrest the wrong person, then the train never pulls out the station. So I'm um, discussing what the best practices are and encouraging them to comply voluntarily and use other wrongful conviction prevention uh, techniques. Goes over pretty well, as you can as you can see. So I've been doing that uh, three or four uh, years. So in terms of uh, going over the systemic deficiencies that lead to wrongful convictions, and this will be the last topic that I cover before we stop. We stop for the first Q and A. Mm. Two minutes Q and A. You want to stop right now? Yeah, my That's fine. Be here, be... Sure. We'll go to Q and A now then. So let's, I know some of you have to leave, but so let's give them a hand. My class is going to stay. Let's... Any of our guests, before you leave, have any questions from Mr. Desk? Go ahead, go back. Okay, um, I'd just like to ask, what was some, <clears throat> the reaction of um, the girl's family when you were released by them to the victim? Yeah, they were very emotional. Uh, they believed in my innocence. They felt really bad for me. In fact, at their um, the, at their invitation, I spent uh, I spent a couple weekends at their house. Uh, we kind of, in a way, we shared something that you know other people don't. In the sense that you know, I consider that we were all victimized by the actual perpetrator. Right. 
Um, your initial defense, do you believe that they were trying to get you convicted, or do you think they were just incompetent? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, they were not incompetent because the legal aid lawyer had the reputation of being the, he was designated as, as, as their uh, priority one lawyer, which meant he was their best trial attorney. And when I've spoken with a lot of uh, prominent attorneys in uh, Westchester and had lunch with them, they're all curious as to who was my public defender. And when I, went, you know, I mentioned his name, uh, they're very surprised because they knew him to be a really good lawyer. So I don't think he was trying, no. Is it hard for you to share your story as much as you do, or is it more therapeutic? Definitely more therapeutic, but it, there, there is a difficulty associated with it. I mean, I'm reliving some, you know, really emotional, difficult things. But um, I feel like I'm making a difference, and it is uh, healing. I like the empathy. I feel like I'm making a difference as well. And so on the balance, it's uh, much more positive than, than not. So that's why I do it. Okay, to follow up? Um, no, it's not something else. That's um, fine. Yeah, why don't um, follow up? So, how, how many people did you know that were in prison with you that you believe were also wrongfully convicted? Yeah, there were 13 people who were exonerated either before me or after me that I um, did time with. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the bigger, that's who I knew personally, but in terms of uh, the overall percentage, so I think that, I mean, the National Registry of Exonerations is just from I forgot now if it's 1989 or 1981, but from that point, either of those points forward, there's more than like 2,000 exonerations with DNA and non-DNA that have been uh, documented there. And we think about uh, every time there's a rogue police officer or a rogue forensic um, analyst, where they collect, for example, in Brooklyn, there's uh, Detective Scarcella, who was, uh, he used the same uh, sole eyewitness who was a drug addict in six different homicide, so she was always in the right place at the right time, if you believe her, which who would. Uh, then his confession cases always start out the same, uh, okay, you got me, so everyone uses the same verbiage. So depending on which newspaper account you read, um, 40, 50, 70 cases of his are under scrutiny, out of which I can't remember how many, I think 12, I think there's 12 cases have been overturned, it's 12, yeah, most recently, um, uh, or Washington. To do 21 years. So that's an example of how this well, That's just one person. And at some point, other people were decompensated and started adopting similar tactics. And how many scar sellers are out there in the world? It's just like in Brooklyn overall, where there was a regime change uh, in terms of the DA was changed, and 23 people were exonerated in two and a half years who would have never saw the light of day if the prior DA had been there for um, 21 to 23 years. They hadn't lost. Uh, you think about how many long-running tenures, and you know those aren't isolated uh, things. And you think about how many different uh, how many different junk sciences exist, things that have passed as legitimate evidence in courts leading to uh, conviction, stuff that has a quasi-scientific air about it, but it's not scientific at all because there is no there are no comparative tables to, for the statistical significance of, of it. I mean, stuff like hair hair testing or uh, bite mark evidence, or tire tracks, or footprints, or even uh, fingerprints, which are very subjective, and there's no real general consensus how many points of match the constitute a match. Uh, there's my favorite, which is my favorite, which would be laughable, except that people have been convicted for decades based on this. Um, uh, the dog scent testimony, where the dog is given an item to smell from the crime scene or from the victim, and then an item from the suspect, and the dog barks, and that means the dog recognize the smell, you know, except that people have been convicted of this uh, based in part on that evidence uh, well, you know, for decades, you know, bullet-led analysis where the pretense is, well, we can tell from the chemical composition of bullets where they were made, where they were shipped to, and, you know, where, how they eventually ended up in a suspect's um, possession. So all those, you think about all those things, and um, I think you were talking about the iceberg, you know, what you see of, above the surface just a little bit of the whole. So I think that the wrongful conviction, and every year uh, the, the conviction, the exoneration is going up. Uh, last year it was 149 and then 132 and then um, 91 and 91. So it's going up. 
So I think that the percentage, and it's not scientific, it's all those factors. You come to your own conclusion. My, my calculation, my educated guess, I think the percentage is uh, 15 to 20 percent. And there's articles like the Wayne State University study that estimated 10,000 uh, new people were wrongfully convicted each year. Other articles saying 75, 82, up to 200,000 people. So there's articles on that. So I'm not the only one um, saying it, but I am the only one mentioning that percentage as a, as a guess. So that's what I think the answer is to that. And so if anybody you know is going to go into law, uh, I certainly think that. Take at least take at least one take at least one wrongful conviction case on your career pro bono. Uh, if everybody did that, then there wouldn't be this dark of representation. And uh, uh, don't be afraid of the cases without DNA. Uh, DNA is only around in five to twelve percent of the cases, so that's not an option most of the time. But there's actually four times the amount of exonerations in non-DNA cases that there are in DNA cases, so they definitely uh, are uh, available. So with that, I'm going to allow the class of East to leave. To leave. Cool. We'll take a short break. I have a break before we um, before you go. I do, um, you know, not only do I want to thank Jeff again in a second, but um, you know, please understand. He mentioned a little bit about Brady evidence. Whether you have junk science, we know that even Park Deeds, and no, no, you know that name. I know my class does. You know, look that up, um, especially the Andrew Yates case, to um, the withholding of evidence. They call Brady material. Um, that's not something from a far away place. A prosecutor here in Nassau County was fired. A prosecutor in Suffolk County was not only fired, but the, the murder suspect was, was released. Um, you know, Texas boasts uh, a fine of $500 and about 10 or two weeks in jail, 10 days, two weeks in jail for someone who put someone in jail for 25 years. 25 yeah, years. Moore, yeah, and he got out in two days for, for good behavior. Yeah, and it, it, yeah it, it, it's, you know, California is just just criminalizing this behavior now, um, you know, think about it, it's our tax dollars and our, our civic duty as citizens, so um, really, give, you know, please give, give Jeffrey, you know. Apologize, I'm sorry to see half of you go, but I know my class up here, so um, if anyone needs to take a break or anything like that, go ahead. Um, thank you again for coming. Thank you.